Amen. Praise God. I was talking to someone today, and uh, we were talking about investing. And this person said, told me, he says, Ross, he said, uh, he said, you know, I learned how to invest by my dad. My dad taught me to invest into things. He said, but we never made any money. Whenever, whenever I followed my dad's advice, we never made any money. We just lost money. And he said, I lost a lot of money. He said, you know what the difference is now? He said, now I'm a tither. And I expect to make money when I invest. And I said, amen to that, you know. You know, thank God we have parents and people that can help us invest. But who can give us the wisdom to place our money in the right place when we have tithers rights, when we're able to say, Lord, I tithe and I give, and you bless all that I touch, including my investments. So that was kind of a testimony to me um, earlier today when, when that person said that I was blessed by that. You know, tither. He goes, I'm a, he said it with conviction. I'm a tither. I'm going to make money investing. Because he wants to bless his children. He wants an inheritance, right? That's, that's godly, isn't it? To give an inheritance? Praise God. Amen. Yeah, continue praying. Um, um, I'm expecting orders this weekend uh, for next week to go to training for a week in North Carolina. And then from there, head on out. Uh, I know Tony is praying that I stay. Uh, so... <laughs> So, Tony, if, if, if you're praying that I stay, you've got to pray that I, that I have an income while I'm here, okay? Because <laughs> I'll gladly stay with an income. Uh, but until then, God has kind of placed me on this mission field with the Army, and I appreciate that. And, uh, um, and I love it. I love doing it, but I love being here, too. So praise God. Yeah, one of the things that we were able to do this year is go to the Minister's Conference. And every time we go to the Kenneth Copeland Minister's Conference, it just blesses us. And, you know, it's never the same speaker every year that we, I mean, we glean from all of them. But there's usually one or two that just, that just impact us and truly changes the course of our year. So 2018, uh, one of the things that we heard, one of the speakers said, he said, uh, he talked about uh, Moses saying, show me your glory. Y'all remember that in Exodus? Um, Moses, you know, I've been kind of stuck on Moses lately. I've been kind of getting to know him a little bit better. I've kind of known about him for a long time, but we're kind of becoming buddies now. And uh, and Moses, you know, Moses, I kind of sense that Moses was kind of lonely, was a lonely guy. Um, you know, he was, uh, had, had to flee and was kind of abandoned in a good way, had to be abandoned from his family, uh, put in an ark and picked up by the Pharaoh, although he was, by the Pharaoh's daughter, although he was um, well taken care of and in a wonderful palace probably and very wealthy and all that, not his family. You know, he didn't belong to them. Um, and then, you know, and then when, when he decided to act out on his own and, and he killed that Egyptian, he had to leave. He left his country, and now he's in a foreign country, married into a foreign family, and he's working nights. And I'm wondering, why is he always working nights? You know, he's out. He's got to be at night because he saw a fire up in the mountains, right? So he, isn't that the picture you have, that it's nighttime, maybe early in the morning? And, uh, and so he's out there, and... and he hears he hears God's voice in a in a bush that seems not to be consumed by fire, and God says Moses. He says his name twice. I noticed that he said Moses, Moses. And uh, and Moses said, Yeah, I'm here. And he says, Come here, you know. And he starts coming. He gets too close to take off your shoes. This is holy place. This is a holy place. And he begins to talk to Moses about a plan that he has, and uh, and so he begins to unfold this plan and. And um, God says that, you know, that I will be there with you. He, he's, he says this a couple of times. He said, my presence will be with you. And in fact, one time Moses even said, if your presence doesn't go with me, I'm not going. So that's how powerful the presence was. So y'all remember when he says, show me your glory? He said, God, I want to see your glory. Show me your glory. And I'm kind of thinking that he's saying, I want to see your face. Because God immediately says, I can't show you my face. No one can see my face and live. He said, but I'll show you. He said, I'll put you in this, the, the, the rocks, the cliff there, the cleft of the rock. I'll hide you, and I'll put my hand over you. And he goes, and then I'll go by, and then I'll lift my hand, and you'll see, you'll see my backside. And, and, the, and, and you'll see the goodness, right? Not the, he didn't say you'll see my glory. He said you'll see my goodness. And so I got to meditating on that, and I said, I said so, so God hides his face, he goes by, he lifts his hand, 
And the way the way the Holy Spirit showed it to me was is that now you can see the glorious works that I am doing before you. When I pass by, I don't pass by and not affect what happens. When I pass by, things change. When I when my presence is here, when my power is here, when my glory is here, things don't say, stay the same. I loved it when uh, when he's when Abraham's Kvetching, when Abraham's complaining and he's saying, uh, he's saying, God, I have no heir. You know, this is in Genesis uh, uh, 13, I believe, Genesis 13. He says, God, I have no heir. This is not even in my notes, Mark. So uh, he says, what, what, my servant is going to get all? And he was a very wealthy man, okay? He said, my servant's going to get everything? And uh, God said, no, 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 Moses, I'm your shield. I'm your buckler. I'm your provider. I'll take care of you. You will have an heir. From your wife, you will have an heir. You will have someone in your household. And he said, in fact, come here. I can just see God doing that. Come here, son, come here. And he began to show Moses, or Abraham, his glory. He said, look up in the sky. God created all that. He said, see the stars? See my glory in the stars? See, See all that I've created up there? He said, you will have more children than you can count in the stars. I love that about God, you know. So, Pastor Brenda and I have been getting up in the morning. We always get up and worship anyway. That's the first thing I do. I wake up. God wakes me up around 4.30 to 5 every morning. I'd like to sleep later, uh, but I seem to wake up at that time. And instead of complaining about it, I've decided a long time ago, if I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm just going to go into prayer, into worship. Not asking prayer. You know the prayer I'm talking about. It's not the prayer like, oh, God, I need this, I need this. It's more of the prayer like, God, I love you, and I worship you, and and thank you, and look what you've done for me. And and I tell you, you can spend several hours doing that, and time flies. The next thing you know, the sun is up, and you're refreshed, right? You're refreshed. Uh, How can you complain about getting up early and spending time with God? Uh, You can't. So... So that's what we do is we get up. And one of the things that changed us with this minister's conference is that, is, is, is that Moses said, show me your glory. And so what I've been doing, what we've been doing every morning when we wake up, not necessarily in any certain order, but sometime when we wake up, almost for me, it's as soon as I wake up, I say, Father, thank you for the glory that you showed me yesterday. And then I begin to recount the blessing. I begin to recount how God's power showed up on scene. I begin to recount how his presence was was with me. I begin to recount um, how his goodness was there. And I begin to think about what he did yesterday. And then I say this, show me your glory today. And when I walk through this day, I want to see your glory. I'm looking for it. I'm expecting your glory to happen. You know, when Moses was in that cleft and God removed his hand, he expected to see something. You got to have an expectation. I I need to have an expectation to see God's glory working in my life every single moment of my day. And so three things come to mind when I think of God's glory. This is not an exhaustive list, but three things come to my mind. When I think of God's glory, I think of God's presence. And that's biblical, right? The presence of God, the glory of God was, was here. Uh, you saw the presence of God uh, with the, uh, um, the cloud by day for the Is- Israelites and the, and the uh, fire by night. That was God's glory. That was God's presence. You, you can see it. And, and understand this, the, the word glory in the Hebrew, which is what we're talking about, means a heavy thing or a weighted thing, something that has great weight to it. So it's tangible. So when I think of God's glory, I think of something I can touch, feel, sense. Uh, it's tangible. It's not something necessary. It's not spiritual. It's something I know. When I see God's glory, I see what God has done. And I, I see it like the mountains are God's glory. You are God's glory. Where do I get this definition? First John, or excuse me, John chapter 1, uh, verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We beheld the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God. You are the glory of Jesus. Listen, because you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you got born again, you became glorious in God. 
You are now the glory of God. Amen? That's shouting stuff. I am the glory of God. God, I am the creation of God. I am the born-again creation of the living God. Like Jesus is, so are we. There's a, a verse in there that says, There will come a day where we see Jesus as we are seen. Praise God. So we talk about the presence. Also, the glory of God talks about the power of God. And I believe it in like the sense of a creative power. Like when God speaks, let there be, the glory came out. The, the word did something. And, and all of a sudden you saw an earth and stars and sun and, and, and all the way down to the seventh day where he says, and, and let there be a human being. Let there be a man and a woman. And they became the glory of God. So I think of the power, kind of the creative power, and I'm sure that's not, again, the only thing it means when that power is there, but there's a creative power in the glory of God. Um, and also, there's the goodness of God, which comes from that, you know, when, when Moses said, let me see your glory, and he showed him his goodness. And God is good, isn't he? God is good. Well, today I'm going to talk about the presence. I'm not going to go, we'd, we'd spend a long time here if I talked about everything. But today I want to talk about the presence of God. Have y'all heard this? I'm, I'm going to go sideways for a second. Have y'all heard this? God, I give you all the glory. Have y'all heard that? God, I give you all the glory. My definition, well, my definition used to be when I say, God, I give you all the glory. What I'm really saying, what I was really saying is, God, I give you all my praise. I give you the praise. I give you praise for everything that I've done. I give you the praise for it, right? And that, that fits. But in my, now my understanding of that is when I say, God, I give you all the glory, that means everything that I am, everything that I can produce or create, everything that I do belongs to you. I give it to you. Because the glory is the product of, the glory is the product of God, Jesus, you, the mountains, all of creation. The glory is the product of a marriage or children. The glory is the product of work, your finances, your money, your paycheck. That's your glory. When you work, you get the glory of it is a paycheck. And so when now when I say, God, I give, you all my, I give you all the glory that everything that I am, I give to you. Amen. Now that'll free you because when it comes to tithes and offerings, it isn't yours. It's God's. That'll free you because it'll free me because if I'm thinking about the time I need to spend for me, and I say, I've already told him, I'm going to give you all my glory, then my time becomes his. My, my, my spouse, my wife, my children become his, not mine. I give you my glory, God. Does that make sense? Y'all search that out. Do your own due diligence when it comes to that. But that's what I believe. That's what I believe. So the presence of God. We already know that uh, Jesus who uh, was the Word who became flesh, right? We, know, we learned this in John chapter 1. And, uh, and it says and the, and the, uh, that, that he was called Emmanuel. Y'all remember this? God with us. I have to say that God has been trying to be with us the whole time. Now, he's always been there, but we haven't acknowledged him. I know in my life there was a time where I did not acknowledge God. I, my, I lived my life for me. He was still there. But I didn't acknowledge him. I didn't acknowledge his presence. I didn't acknowledge his power. I didn't acknowledge his goodness. I didn't acknowledge him at all. I just assumed I was in control of my destiny. And I was. I, I decided there's two choices in life. And God is a God of choice. I could choose life or I can choose death. And at that moment, I was choosing self, which is death. And then came a day where I went to the front of the church, Little Assembly God Church in Tucson, and I gave my life, I gave my glory to God. And, he, and, he, and I was born again. And I live my life for him. It's been a process. I'm learning to live my life more for him every single day. Am I the only one doing that? Are we in a process where we're living our life? We're learning how to live our life completely for him and trying not to live our life for ourselves. I know it's a struggle. There's that tension. But God has always wanted to be Emmanuel, God with us. Do you remember in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1, it says that God would walk with the man and woman in the garden in the cool of the day. God would walk with them. He, 
God would spend time with them. That was his desire. That's, and that's pre-curse. So when I see things that are pre-curse or, or pre-chapter 3 of Genesis, those are things that were supposed to be eternal. They were intended to be eternal. Marriage was pre-curse. I'll just throw that out there. I'm not going to go anymore with that. Relationship with God, presence, the presence of God was, supposed, was intended to be eternal. Now, he's always been with us. You know, even David said, where can I go to escape you? I can't, I can't find the highest mountain. I can't even go into hell and, and hide from you. Wherever I go, you are. Thank God, right? I can't run from God. Praise the Lord. So his presence, that's what I'm going to talk about. So when I say in the morning, when I say, God, show me, a part of what I'm saying is, God, show me your glory. I'm expecting to see God's presence in my day. I'm expecting to experience God in the, in the now, in the present time, and, and with me wherever I go, I expect to see him. In John, and, excuse me, Exodus 33, 14, it says, my presence will go with you. This is, he's talking to Moses. My presence with, will go with you, and I will give you rest. I don't believe Moses had had rest his whole life. I think he's always had an expectation placed on him. He was always the outsider. He was always trying to prove himself. He was always trying to, to, to make things happen. And I know that, that there's times, and I've been learning this, and probably about four years ago, Pastor Brennan and I have really been practicing this, this presence of God about rest. Now, that doesn't mean being idle. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about not working. There's times where we do that too. But I'm talking about resting in God the trust that I have in God, that I don't have to think about every single thing, every single day. How is this going to work out? What's going to happen? Here's the plan. And if this happens, then I go here. And if this is a no, then I go here. And then, then three things here. And, I, and then I, I'm trying to figure out all the things that I need to do to make sure this works out. God, give me rest. I don't want to figure it out. Here's what I know. I want to hear you today, and I want to do what you tell me to do today knowing and trusting that when I do what you tell me to do and I rest in that, that it will work out for me the best. So orders were canceled. That used to just break me, right? It's, it's training I'm missing. Uh, if I don't have this training that I was supposed to be at right now, I'm supposed to be there right now in South Carolina, I can't get promoted. That pushes it off for another year, promotion for another year. That's... That's a, that's a big thing. Obviously, I don't get paid. I kind of need money living this life. We all need money. Even Jesus said, I know you need money, right? Got to pay taxes and all that stuff. But we rested in it. We weren't going to worry about it. We had other things to think about, uh, good things. Uh, uh, we were celebrating uh, Brenda's grandmother's going into heaven and, and spending, being with Jesus and her husband and, and she was 96 and it was a celebration and we were celebrating that with family. Um, we had other things we were doing at the time, um, just dealing with stuff that we weren't going to worry about. Now what? Now what, God? And you know, without me doing a single thing, they worked it out where I can take this class in June. Or, and actually, they gave me four options when to do it. And they would let me go ahead and go before the board and get promoted without the class. doesn't happen. That's God's hand. That's God's presence. God is moving and doing things because I'm resting in him. I don't get my hands in the way. I'm out of the way. God, I'm out of your way. I'm going to rest. Amen? So when you, when you have the presence of God, when you experience the presence of God, you experience the rest of God. God, you rest in God. Amen. Not only that, the presence of God will overwhelm any enemy. Listen, when the enemy comes at you, when Satan comes at you, when the enemy comes at you, you know when you wake up first thing in the morning, maybe that's not you, maybe it's just the way I was. I'd wake up first thing in the morning, my eyes wake up, it was like the devil sitting right there, got a list of things. Okay, this needs to be done, this ain't happening, you're going to lose this, and this is... Right? You know, as soon as you open your eyes, oh, devil, go away. Quit, quit buffeting me. Quit, quit attacking, quit afflicting me. But why am I talking to the devil? You know what I do? Nope. 
resist you, I'm in the presence of God. And the devil can't stand the presence of God. He cannot stand the presence of God. So the presence of God, where do I get this? Psalms 9.3, the presence of God overwhelms the enemy. Praise the Lord. Listen, if you're being attacked by, don't, don't focus on the attack. Embrace the living God. Understand that God is present in your life. And his love for you is so overwhelming. His care for you is so wonderful that no enemy can withstand his presence. Praise God. presence of God brings a peace beyond understanding. Right? Peace. You know, in peace, shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken. God is not mad at me. In fact, it's just the opposite. God has already forgiven me. I may be mad at me, and he's saying, stop it. Peace. Our relationship's no longer broken. You've accepted my son, Jesus Christ. You now walk in perfect peace with me. There's so many people that walk around guilty when they're not. For now there is therefore no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? God is not judging you. Even Jesus said, he said, I didn't come to condemn the world. You're already condemned. Those are his words. But I came to bring you life. Amen. So in the presence of God is a rest and the presence of God is the pro- overwhelming protection against the affliction of the enemy the the presence of God is is this wonderful almost indescribable peace that when you're meditating on God being right there with you that you're able to just <sighs> just take a breath all is well no no the world is falling apart going to hell in a handbasket, right? All around you. But you're taking a deep breath and saying, all is well with me because I have a peace with God. And gladness. Psalm 2, 6 says there's exceeding gladness. You know, there's some places we go to and I've seen it, witnessed it, even experienced it, where this overwhelming laughter comes upon people. Have y'all seen that? And they're just laughing and laughing and laughing for no apparent reason. No one told a joke. They're just full of the gladness of God. God is so overwhelmingly touching them at the moment that they just laugh hysterically. And it's pretty funny to watch. It's almost contagious. I begin to laugh with them in a, in a way, you know. You begin to look at it and laugh. What a lot of people do is they, they're afraid of that. We can't. There's nothing to be afraid of. That's God. That's God bringing gladness into probably someone's life that's been pretty miserable for a while. And God has really ministered to them and really touching them. And they begin to laugh for no apparent reason, but, but that God is present. But that God is present. You know, sometimes I've heard the, Kenneth Copeland say this. Sometimes you just got to laugh at the devil. <laughs> and he says, you got you to force it. Y'all have heard this, right? Y'all have heard him say this. Ha, ha, ha. You know, it's, he's not really laughing, but he's, he's laughing. It's like when you don't really feel like smiling and you smile, it makes you feel better. Sometimes I smile. Eh, I don't want to smile. But you do, and it makes you feel better. It makes you feel better. Listen, we can purposefully be glad. Why? Because in God's presence is exceeding gladness. Exceeding gladness. Exceeding gladness. Not just glad. You're not just glad. You're exceedingly glad. Wow. I need to be exceedingly glad. Hallelujah. You know, when God has his presence, and you recognize his presence, God will show you his ways. Right? I I like the Proverbs chapter 3, 5 and 6. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths, right? Let me rephrase that. Don't think about how you're going to do things. 
Recognize God is in your presence. Recognize God is with you. Acknowledge his presence. And then follow him. He will direct you. Listen to him. And he will direct you. I love it. I love it that his presence will made, make known to me where, where and what and what to say, what to do, how to believe, which way to go. And in that, I find you will find joy. You will find joy. There's a joy that's, that's, that's in you because you know that God truly loves you. And there's this joy in you. And, and even though things are happening that, don't, that aren't very joyful, but you don't get your joy from the outside, do you? Do you get your joy from going to Disneyland? Do you get your joy from going to see family and friends? No, you get your joy from the presence of God inside of you. You're happy to go to Disneyland. You're happy to see family. You're happy to do this. But joy is deeper than happiness. Listen, I guarantee you, you go to Disneyland every single day, you'll quit being happy there. It will not be the happiest place on earth. But you'll still have joy. Amen? God's presence will deliver you. That's what he was telling Moses. He said, listen, I am present with you. I want to deliver the children of Israel. I want, I've heard their cries, and I'm sending them a deliverer. And I'm going with you, Moses. You're, I'm delivering them through you. You and I are going, and we are delivering my people. God is a deliverer. So when the enemy comes against you or you need deliverance, immediately begin to imagine the presence of God. God is with me. I stand with God. When I speak, I speak the very words of God. When I talk, when I work and move and have my being, it's in the presence of God. Nothing can withstand me. I love what he told Joshua. He says, wherever you place your foot, because I'm with you, no man will stand against you. Praise God. The presence of God will deliver you out of anything. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you shall be condemned. And that is the heritage of the saints. That is your heritage. And you have this presence. And you can look at the enemy straight and say, You are a defeated foe. I have been delivered already. Not going to be. I'm already delivered. Because the presence of God is in me. So the presence of God is the deliverer. And I want to tell you, the presence of God, and I'm going to end with this, close with this. The presence of God will refresh you. I love to be refreshed. You know, vacations, if you're not, the vacations I go on are refreshing. Because I do nothing on vacation. Now, Brenda likes, Pastor Brenda likes to go and see sights and go, 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 go. That's not refreshing to me. It is to her, not to me. I like to read a book and sit on a beach and do nothing, right? Glen Ivy. Have, have any of y'all been to Glen Ivy before? Am I the only one? It's refreshing. Y'all need to go. To, it's in Corona. You need to go to Glen Ivy. It's refreshing. It's refreshing. To get away and just to be in the presence of God alone is refreshing. But in Acts 3.19, there's a prerequisite for the refreshing. Acts 3.19 says, Repent. Oh, my gosh, are we going there, Pastor? Yes, we are going there. Yes, we are going there. You know, and this just, it isn't just for those who are not saved. Listen, there's times, and I know I don't have to tell you this, where I have to, you have to repent before God so that I can be forgiven, so that I can be cleansed, and so that I can be refreshed. Amen? So repent, therefore, and be converted, be changed, in other words. Don't continue in the same direction. Repent that your sins may be blotted out, blotted out, as if they never existed, blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Praise God. Don't let sin in your life. Now, God hasn't left you. He's still there. But don't let sin in your life make you feel like you're disconnected from God. That's what I've... 
That's what I've realized, is that, is that when, I, when, I, when I sin, even though he forgives me, I feel like there's still something between us. There's not. Once I ask God to forgive me, he has blotted it out. It is forgiven. It is. I am cleansed. I am completely righteous as if I never sinned a day in my life. So I've got to change my mind. I've got to convert my mind to thinking that once I repent, God has blotted that out and I'm no longer that guilty, condemned person and that God has, has, has forgiven me, cleansed me, and is now it's refreshing that I feel like there's nothing between me and God and I can boldly go to the throne room of grace and I can talk to him like Abba Father, sit on the side. I always think of sit on the side of his bed and just talk to him like in the morning like the kids do when they come in and wake you up, right? That I have that close of a relationship with God, but I have found that sin blocks in my mind, not his, in my mind. So I need to for, ask for God to forgive me, repent, receive the forgiveness let it change me. Let my mind know that God has forgiven me. And then be refreshed that our relationship, there's nothing against us. It's, it's one again. We're one again. Amen? Amen. So praise God. So, Father, I just thank you. I thank you, Father, that you have made it so simple. I, I love that you gave us an example in Jesus your son, a human being that did only what you said, said only what you said to say, and because of that, he was proven to be perfect. And we can live the life the way Jesus lived. But thank you, Lord, that you gave us an alternative that when we do sin and when we don't listen to you and when we don't do what you tell us to do, that you gave us First John 1, 9. That we confess our sin to you, and you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, right now, I speak to all of us that are here listening to this word. If there is sin between you and God, if there is something between you and God, all you have to do is confess it to God, not to me, not to anyone. This is between you and God. And just say, God, forgive me. I repent. Thank you, Lord. And I receive your, cleanse, your cleansing of my person, of who I am. I am clean. I am totally righteous before you right now. You are not mad at me. You have blotted out that sin I just confessed to you. And now I am refreshed knowing that you and I, there's nothing between us. That you and I are completely in sync, are completely in fellowship. We're, we're together on this. Your presence and my presence stand, not just next, next to each other, but in each other. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Listen, if you've just asked God to forgive you, be forgiven. Don't sit there and beat yourself up over it. Amen?